Hey, revolutionaries. I'm excited to bring you this week's episode with Dr. Stefan Meyer, where we're talking about killing sacred cows. Yes, killing sacred cows. Yes, I know what you're thinking. No, no animal lovers out there. Don't worry about it. No animals were harmed in this episode, okay? <laughs> or by Stephen ever, okay? So, um, but we are talking about a radical change and his research into it uh, and his re- recent PhD that he um, that he was just awarded. So it's really an interesting episode. I love his passion and take on digging into radical change and figuring out uh, where and why we need it and who needs it and how corporations need it. So check it out. Can't wait for you guys to listen to this episode. But before we get there, I have a question for everyone out there. Okay, a question for everyone. Have you downloaded the priming guide yet? Have you checked out the new website? That's right. There's a new Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution dot com website out there check it out uh let me know what you think there's a few new pictures and just a different layout and such of the website so i'm trying to get that improved this year um got that released and also i put together this priming guide which i I mentioned in the in the kickoff episode there a priming guide for reinvention so if you haven't downloaded that go to the website and download it if you just you know click to join the email list you'll get the you'll get the the download there and uh, it gives you seven simple ways to get yourself primed for reinvention because I think that's the uh, that's the key is kind of opening your mind and changing your behavior patterns to get yourself open to change. You know, everybody intellectually kind of knows probably things they should be doing uh, different in their life or or trying to improve themselves in some way, but we never seem to get around to it sometimes. Anyways, that's what the guide's for uh, to help us uh, move along in that direction. So check it out. Also, by the way, um, when I released this, uh, a couple of people were asking about, hey, that design, the uh, priming guide looks great, the design of it. And uh, I mentioned that my friend Rachel was, uh, that I got her to do the design for it. She's really great. And I forgot to mention that she was on episode 32. So this goes back a ways. Uh, but if you haven't checked it out, check out JJRR episode 32. And Rachel's on there and you'll hear you know, her voice and how she thinks about design and and of course, if you're interested in getting in touch with her, you know, just reach out to her. Or of course, you can always send an email to Jim Jim at Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution dot com, and I can connect you if you're interested to her. She's got great design skills. Um, okay, let's get to this week's episode. Let's do it. Okay, this episode of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution is brought to you by MGS Graphics, a graphics production support firm delivering services to ad agencies, graphic designers, brand managers, retailers, and product manufacturers worldwide. MGS Graphics is not only reinventing, they are revolutionizing graphics production support. So how do they do it? Well, they free up your team to focus on big ideas while MGS Graphics handles the execution. Their skilled experts are ready to jump in when your project load spikes so you can avoid the headaches and extra overhead cost of hiring new staff. Plus, you won't lose out on work opportunities because of delivery and production timelines. Did you know their skilled staff of professionals use the best and most widely used graphics software on the market? And when it comes to project management, MGS Graphics provides the highest level of customer service by assigning you a dedicated project manager. And they use the industry-leading project management software to ensure all communication, deadlines, and deliverables are met. This allows teams and clients to collaborate with each other in real time, no matter where you are around the world. Need more than just production? MGS Graphics also has a fully staffed creative team. Ask about their design services and agency partnerships. So, if you're looking for a partner to accelerate and support your business's growth, go to mgsgraphicspro.com forward slash JJRR for 15% off your first project. 15%? That is revolutionary. Go to mgsgraphicspro.com forward slash J-J-R-R. That's mgsgraphicspro.com forward slash J-J-R-R. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, 
Visit JimJimsReinventionRevolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hey everybody, hey, this is Jim Jim. Welcome to episode 78 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And I'm talking today with sacred cow exterminator, Dr. Stefan Meyer. Uh, and I imagine we're talking about killing sacred cows today. So, <laughs> Stefan, welcome to the Reinvention Revolution. Hello, greetings from Frankfurt, Germany. Okay, all right. Hey, thanks for joining me today. And um, I think that's the most um, interesting job title I think that someone's had that's been on the podcast is Sacred Cow Exterminator. <laughs> so maybe we could start there with telling people like what that means if they're not familiar with the phrase sacred cow. I think most people are. But why are you running around the world now killing sacred cows? Tell me about it. Yes, uh, first of all, I'm not actually killing any cows, so no animals are harmed in this experiment. Okay, good, I was worried. To tell you about. <laughs> yeah, I, I once had an interview with, with some vegetarians, and they were eagerly offended about oh, wow. everything okay. I said, <laughs> until I, I clarified the whole situation. Okay, so right. in uh, from my point of view, a sacred cow is a behavior that maybe used to be appropriate in the past, but is not anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call a sacred cow. So my native language is German, and in German, the the uh, metaphor of the sacred cow is very common. So we use this quite often here. Mm -hmm. um, so let me tell you where I came from. I, I used to be and still am a business consultant. I studied business psychology and then was uh, started my career with Accenture, who were pretty new at that time in Germany, mm -hmm. had some very, very big projects, like 300 consultants at a time on one project, things of that size. And uh, But uh, since 20 years, I've been self-employed as a consultant. And I'm usually at an age where you don't do this anymore, what I just did, but anyway, I did it, which is g going back to university and writing a doctorate dissertation. That's what I did. Right. And the reason behind it was simply that now I have 25 years of experience in change management initiatives in organizations, and I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I thought there may be some differences there, and we just don't know enough about it. Or more specifically, I thought there's at least two kinds of change. One of them is the gradual change. Oh, sorry. I just have to switch off my landline phone. Oh, yeah. Just a minute. <laughs> no worries. We can take a second. Okay. So I saw at least two different kinds of change. One of them is the gradual change, the step-by-step -step change, which the majority of change initiatives are just about. It's like we have to do something, but we don't really want to change. And let's let's do some, some tiny changes on the surface, and that's about it. And then we are satisfied. Mm -hmm. I've seen too many of these kinds of change, and nothing really happened, and nothing changed for the better. But in, on a few rare occasions, I also saw this kind of change that I call a radical change, which is the change where the rules of the games are changing. And this very often has the potential of actually being a change for the better. But I also found out that we know quite a lot about this step-by-step -step change, this gradual change. There's literature about it, and the bigger companies even have entire departments about small changes and experts. And I think we know quite a lot about this, and some organizations have it firmly integrated into their own corporate culture. However, about radical change, I maintain we know quite little and mm, it started out as it always starts out with a dissertation i looked into the literature i didn't f find what i was looking for so i discovered that there's a huge gap in literature and i was trying to fill up the gap so what did i do i went to this english university in england um also I have to tell you the story. So someone told me about this university in English in England where you can do this kind of research. And I said, okay, but bef before I sign anything, I will get to to uh, a German university just to have a comparison. And sure. I talked to this one guy, the, the advisor about uh, doing doctorates, and he told me that the kind of research I wanted to talk about, like in the, in the crossroads between psychology and business administration, interdisciplinary research that's verboten in germany verboten. Of course, wow, okay <laughs> of course that's that's not true but that's what he told me anyway and that made it easy for me to go to to I england see. maybe that so, was his sacred cow 
Like he didn't yeah, want probably. to change, right? I, I think so. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly. Okay. So I went to England and I said, um, I'm I'm only going to do any doctorate research if I can completely define my very own topic. I'm I'm uh, I I want to do research about, and the English were fine with that, and so I did. And um, I figured. I want to talk to people who have experience in radical change, not only once, but several times in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I had a discussion with my supervising professor, and we came to the agreement that probably interim managers who are hired for restructuring initiatives are probably very competent people to talk about this. So I started interviewing them. First of all, interim managers from Germany, because I already had con some connections established. And then I had lunch with a business friend from the States. And he said, why don't you also talk to some interim managers from the States? I could give you some introductions. And I said, we have a deal. Okay. So I also talked to interim managers from the States. And then my supervising professor said, well, we need some different perspectives. And I should also talk to consultants and line managers. And since I was already on my way on an international kind of research, I talked to those from Canada. Canada, over South Africa to Hong Kong. So lastly, four different continents of um, experts I talked to about radical change. And I made long form interviews up to two hours and I extracted their insights. So in all in all, I gathered almost 200 different insights, which is quite a lot and too much to carry around in your head at the same time. So <laughs> right. I condensed these insights into one tiny little framework that I called the sacred cow framework. And this is practically the essence of my dissertation. So sacred cow, I like this term a lot, is also an acronym. So every letter stands for something. Mm. But in addition to that, sacred cow is a matrix. So it's sacred times cow. In other words, six times three. Mm. And in some 18 different aspects to consider when you want to practice a successful change initiative. Uh -huh. in other okay, words, the definition you, of sacred cow. I got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you are in the midst of a radical change initiative and you want to make sure, did I think about everything? Did I overlook something? Then you take a look at the sacred cow framework and it gives you an answer to that question. So this is from the academic point of view. And then later on, when I tried um, explaining what I did, some people had uh, difficulties um, differentiating whether they actually need a radical change or not. So I, I also developed this thing I called the cow canvas. And the cow canvas is a sequence of six questions you could ask yourself in order to figure out, do I, at the moment, do I need a radical change, yes or no? Interesting. And, okay. uh, it's, it's, it's very placative, metaphorical, and, and easy to understand, this cow canvas. So um, probably your next question is going to be, so what are some things I found out during my research? <laughs> exactly. So what did you learn, man? I mean, I think this is such an interesting topic, uh, certainly a timely topic, right? Because the world all of a sudden is just spinning it wildly in a lot of different directions. Um, certainly if you're been in business a while, a corporation that, you know, when you get to some scale and some large organization, obviously it's a little bit harder to change, but now you it's really required. So it's pretty interesting that you decided to dive into this topic. Right. So can you can you tell us some of the maybe the platforms like your sacred cow yeah. to find that for us? But also if you, if you, you know pull out a couple things that you things. that you learned that was really interesting. Yes. So when I made these interviews, I had a list of questions, but there was one question that from my point of view was the most interesting one. Okay. And the question was, does every organization need a radical change every now and then? I found this question so interesting because I, I thought if the answer to that is yes, then we have to completely rethink how corporate leadership is working. And uh, so I asked the, the people this question, does every organization need a radical change? And this is science. One half of my respondents said yes, and the other half said no. Okay. So the ones that said yes argued, well, if you think entrepreneurship on a long-term basis, you have to somehow renew your organization every few years and preferably before the crisis hits you. So you have, this is the normal part of leadership, to right. do radical change occasionally. Right. And the other half of my respondents said, no, radical change is a good thing, but only under certain prerequisites. And I asked, so what are these? And they, they gave me three of them. So one of them is a change in law. 
In other words, your business model becomes illegal. That's always a good reason to. <laughs> right. So Probably radical change. change. Right. <laughs> I actually once had a client where this was appropriate. Uh, the second example is a change in technology. So newer approaches, mm -hmm. which usually um, brings you into the situation that from your client's perspective, your competitors look more modern than you do because your competitors have these new ways of doing things and you are still clinging to the old way of doing things and then you're sooner or later out of the game. Right. So a change in technology, uh, the modern word for that may be digitization or digital transformation mm -hmm. uh, is probably something that affects every one of us. So, and lastly, the third reason for radical change is events of higher power, such as 9-11 or a pandemic. Right. So any which way you belong to Either one of these religions, I call them religions, so either you believe radical change anyway, yeah. and you need one, or you believe radical change only under certain circumstances, of which one one or two or even three might be appropriate, depends on your business. Mm -hmm. So any which way you look at it, um, there's still serious reason for you to evaluate, do I need a radical change right now, yes or no? Right, right. So what so what are some of the challenges? And I totally agree with that. I was thinking, you know, I don't know if you've heard this um, sort of, I guess, turn of a phrase in regards to meditation. So some people, like when they say, do I need to meditate? Kind of reminded me of this question you asked your clients here or your, your uh, interviewees. Um, and some people, you know, the response would be, well, if, but I don't have time to meditate. And it's like, well, if you don't, you know, you should always meditate a few minutes a day. And if you don't have time to meditate, then you should meditate for an hour a day. Mm -hmm. Right. And the people that responded to, oh, I'll, we only need to change under certain circumstances. Maybe that might mean that they actually are in more need of radical change. It's perhaps. That's like the woodcutter who said, I have, I don't have time to sharpen the saw. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. So anyways, I was just cut. It was just reminded me of that. Um, but so, so what are the, what are the challenges though? Because if people recognize, Hey, we need to change. Obviously the world's changing. What stops people from changing or organizations from changing because you don't see that many radical changes. I mean, from time to time you see it and you see some really good organizations, for example, like Amazon or Tesla or whatever that like are really, they're diving fully force into changing continually very rapidly, but other companies don't quite get the message somehow. So what, what are the challenges there? Yeah, the, the reason why I call myself sacred cow exterminator is there's a mission behind that. I think that people should know more about radical change. It, it should maybe even become part of the business education, professional education of people who want to be in leadership and running an, a, a company, that you have to know at least some basic knowledge about radical change when you need it, how you do it, what you can expect when initiating it. Um, I think there should be more knowledge out there and people should be used to knowing when to have a radical change and how to handle it. I see. Is that the, so the six by three matrix, is that what you help? Is that, is that the, the framework that you use to help people kind of move and kind of open them up to change or how does it, how does that work? Um, these are, yeah, these are different aspects. Like, uh, when you, when you don't know, am I there yet? Have I reached my goal? Or is there still something I should consider changing as well? And, and each of these um, aspects are some things you should consider if they are reflected in your organization. But um, this, this is a very complex model. I think we should start from an e easier angle right now. Okay. Let's take a look at the cow canvas because I, I think this is the most helpful to, to, to somehow get to wrap your head around the, the entire uh, subject. So, okay, let's imagine in the 1970s, my youth, which tells you how old I am, in the 1970s, <laughs> if you want to listen to music over here in Germany, there weren't that many options, especially if you liked pop music or rock music, because um, television was bad, there was no music on television, or it, it was not the right kind of music. The same applied probably to radio. Um, so there, there weren't many options except for you going to the record store. If you already knew what kind of music you like, you would go to the record store and buy one of these big black vinyl records. Right. And with that record under your arm, you would go home. 
to your living room. Why to your living room? Because that's where the record player is at. And then you would put the record on the record player and it would be a feast and you would maybe make a tea or light a candle or whatever and <laughs> listen to your new record. Right, of course. So that was already a celebration. But you needed that record and most of all you needed the record player to play the record. And in the 70s, there was one brand of record players in Germany what, that was considered maybe the Mercedes among all record players. So it was the number one prestige brand. And uh, the company was called Dual, D-U-A-L, Dual. Mm -hmm. very, every, every German knew about this brand Dual. And many people wanted to have some, one of the record players they produced. So you might wonder if they were the leading brand, the number one prestige brand, why aren't they still around? I mean, yeah, I don't know. They could, them. they could be the the leading music provider nowadays. Maybe the leading internet portal or the leading streaming service, whatever. Right. But they completely disappeared. They went bankrupt, and so what happened? And I, I maintain that they didn't take carefully. Uh, into consideration that they had some sacred cows on board and and they ignored these sacred cows until it was too late. So what happened? I have this cow canvas and that consists of six questions and let's just go through these six questions with the example of the record player company okay. in order to understand what I'm talking about. So the first um, the first question is what the customer gets. So what does the customer get when he buys something from Dual? That's very easy. He gets a record player. Okay. Second question. What is the sacred cow? The sacred cow is what do I in this situation, what do I believe about myself? So if you would have asked the employees of the company Dual, so, so what do you do? They would say, oh, we are in the business of doing record players, record, building record players. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And Step number three would be the taboo. The taboo is what everybody knows, but nobody dares to speak out in the open. And the taboo in that case is, when do people need a record player? They need a record player when they want to listen to music. And as long as the record player is the only way for them to get to the music, as long as this happens, they need a record player. Right. But what happens if they find a different way, a more elegant way, a cheaper, technologically more advanced, uh, more luxurious, whatever. Mm -hmm. If they find a different way, they probably don't need any record players anymore. So that's the taboo. Step number four is the essence or the real, the realness behind it, you could say. So what's the essence behind it? Why do people buy a record player? Because they want to listen to music. But why do they want to listen to music? Because I would say it makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. So then we come to step number five, the radical change. Are we really in the business of making record players? The employees could ask themselves. Are we really in the business of making record players? Or are we in the business of providing music so that people could feel good? Right. And that would be the radical change, completely redefining who you are and what you do. And if they would have done that, then the last step would be not what your customer gets, but what your customer should get. What your customer should get is music. Mm -hmm. Any which way is the most appropriate one at the situation. So I claim if they would have thought about their sacred cows, if they would have, have identified their sacred cows early enough, they could still be on the market and even a major player in the music pre providing for happiness industry, however you want to call it. So <laughs> right, absolutely, this is the yeah. sacred cow. And of course, this is a simple example and everyone knows that vinyl records almost completely disappeared. Only some hardcore fanatics still use them. But anyway, they don't play this major role they used to do. And anyone can easily understand that if they uh, wouldn't have been so fixated on the record and instead would have seen everything from a broader angle of music and providing happiness, um, they could still be a leading company. And I would say that this happens similar to this happen are situations that happen in every industry whatever mm -hmm. industry you're in you have your sacred cows and you just have to be careful watch out identify them and take a look at them and say can we still afford to have these sacred cows or should we slowly get rid of them right right well i like the idea of yeah just kind of continually to uncover those layers of you know what are we really doing what's our real value what are we really providing i, I think that's something that you need to um Kind of think about it on a daily basis. Like I, like I know Jeff Bezos is, you know, their approach at Amazon is it's day one. 
you know, every day they come into the office, they, they're thinking like it's the first day. So they're really, they're trying to stay in touch with what are we really doing? What are we really providing? What's the value that we're, you know, they, they don't kind of fall back into that thing of like, we're just producing these widgets over here and that's, that's good enough, you know? So yeah, it's a great, great framework. Well, listen, I have a, I have a question for you. So now that we understand what the sacred cow is and, and your, your approach to life and your passion about finding out more research or information about radical change, uh, I want to talk about uh, the change that you kind of most recently made once you got out of school with your PhD. So, you know, before this, you were working in the corporate world, basically, you know, at Accenture, it's a big consulting company, and you've seen a lot of, I guess, big business and, you know, solved a lot of problems and challenges in that regard. Uh, but now you're moving into the entrepreneurial world, which which I want to talk about a little bit because I think it's pretty interesting. It's like you're taking on your own radical change in your own life. So, <laughs> uh, which you know, obviously the podcast uh, that's a big dose of of what I like to talk about here. So tell me about you know you you got out of school with this PhD. You did this awesome research. You could probably go anywhere and get an incredible high paying corporate job somewhere and be rocking it. But you decided to go in the entrepreneurial route. What kind of entered your mind about that, and how is that going for you? Um, yeah, I think there's some there's a need for education, and I'm I'm trying to provide it gradually. I still have to build up everything, and I know there's a lot on my to do list. I have to do like writing articles and writing books, etc. Um, but still, I think there is a need for people to know more about uh, radical change, and if you if you so want. Uh, there once was this guy um, in the States who said, who claimed that people need more financial education. You know, his name is Robert Kiyosaki, and now he spends all this time educating people. Right. And maybe from a similar point of view, you could say people need to know more about change, and I'm trying to provide this, what they need. I see. So you're, yeah, I like, that's a good analogy, actually, because I think... I think with your point of view and your take on it and your passion about it, maybe you just wouldn't feel comfortable enough or fit in enough with a larger corporate, you know, place to work, right? You, you're just like, hey, I'm, I see this in a different way. I need to do this my way. I think that's where Robert Kiyosaki was coming from, right? Yeah, but also if the big corporations want to benefit from my knowledge i would uh, happily be able to provide it to them that's not <laughs> oh cer well certainly you that's can not consult back to them but you know yeah, yeah. i'm just saying working within that framework i, I think it's mm. um i think it's fun to at least for me and that's where i'm coming from you know reinventing myself kind of moving into the entrepreneurial world versus the corporate world where i started my career uh, i think there's just so much um uh just opportunity there an advantage and to have fun and redefine how you work and really bring some interesting new ideas uh, to the party. So I think that's yeah, cool. Yeah, there once was this American philosopher with the name of Thomas Kuhn. He's a he's, mm -hmm. uh, long time dead, but he, had, he wrote this tiny little book that became very famous, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. And in that book, he brought up a new term that nobody had ever heard before, and the term is called paradigm shift. And now everybody knows what a paradigm shift is, but in those times, it was a pretty new expression. And right. what what Kuhn claims is that every time you set up a new business, uh, not business model, but every time you set up a new model, a new paradigm, people do things in a specific way. And every paradigm works for a certain time. And then comes the time where it doesn't work anymore. And Kuhn claimed this only for the area of science, but I think it's very easily transferable into other life areas as well, especially the area of uh, business and economics. So in other words, what I want to say with this is some people think you think of a business model, you invent your business model, and then you expect it to run for your entire life. <laughs> right, and maybe yeah. for it may be applicable applicable for some few business models, but the general idea is that business models are only valid for a certain amount of time, and then they are outdated, and then you need a new one. Mm -hmm. So you have to think more about constantly renewing yourself, constantly renewing your business model, you renewing your organization. That should be a normal thing. It, it should be quite normal to say, okay. Um, this seems to work. I'm going to give it a chance. I let it run for a few years, and then I'm going to stop it and replace it with something more appropriate. Mm -hmm. That should be a very normal thing. So I think that radical change is something that should be uh, become standard. 
And uh, right. Well, I think you know, I think you've hit on something right there. I'm, I think that's really a, a great point to kind of bring out here is that you know when people have an idea, um, you know, they fall in love with their idea. You know, it's like it's my baby. It's it's beautiful. My, it's my baby, and to me, it's always going to be beautiful. <laughs> you know, and, and they they think that it will last forever, that it's always going to be appropriate. And it, maybe there's some human psychology there about, you know, when you're, you know, you come up with your first idea and there's, there is that change in innovation in the first idea, but then you hold on to it really tight usually and maybe for too long. And that's, that's the, uh, I guess the road you're trying to kind of keep people from going down that path and thinking about, Hey, and, and this, this applies to all areas of life even right. to politics like you in the states once established the rule that your president cannot run more than two uh, terms right and we in germany we don't have this rule so our equivalent to your president is our chancellor mm -hmm. and in theory a chancellor can run until he drops dead you know i didn't and know so that. we okay. had several ch Germany. chancellors who 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 were um, in charge for 16 years in this is just too much. I mean, this stifles um, the society and and um, discourages people from renewing uh, uh, essential things. So um, the people who thought of you no know, in your country, the people who said no president more than two terms, they they had this in mind that every now and then you need a change, and if you don't if you don't initiate the change, then uh, things get stale and, and right. Uh, right. there's a development backwards and uh, that's not good. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I think there is some, um, it keeps the vitality there or keeps the, you know, maybe it's an awkward, frustrating system like our, our idea of a democracy here in the States, you know, could be rough and tumble sometimes, but I think it is good to kind of flip it around so that there's no one prevailing idea that, that takes over for many, too many years, you know? So it's the, the balance is good, I think, and different types of ideas. So in terms of this thing of paradigm shifts, so you got me thinking, and I, I, I knew I was thinking about, you know, what I could um, ask, ask you since you're sitting in Germany, and, you know, I, I don't talk to that many people that are in Germ Germany uh, on a regular basis, and about paradigm shift. So one of the things I like to do and think about is kind of, Innovation investing. So I'm, I'm, I've always been a long-term investor. My background's in technology uh, and you know advanced technology development. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, in terms of this paradigm shift, like EVs, electric vehicles, it's a big deal these days. So I wanted to mm -hmm. get your thoughts on, um, I know Tesla's building a big manufacturing plant, supposedly in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's some, some newer uh, companies, like I don't know if you're familiar with EV Box. So they are a company that builds electric vehicle charging stations, and they are they are going to be pulled onto the market here by a new SPAC, which is a special purpose acquisition company. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about this. I know I know I didn't, we didn't talk about <laughs> this in advance. What I was going to ask you, but what are your thoughts on the challenges of the traditional German car manufacturers? Right, because the, you know the German car manufacturers have been leaders in the world for a long time. So Mercedes, BMW, Audi, Volkswagen. Uh, but this new EV generation of vehicles is coming, and people like Tesla are starting to really challenge these premier luxury brands. How's Germany feeling about it? Yeah, it's very interesting because the uh, automotive industry is one of the core industries in Germany. It so is, yeah. Many jobs depend on that, and right. people are confused and not sure how, how this is going to turn out. <laughs> right. um, I also am a psychologist. I once studied psychology, and I, I always see these um, events in history from a psychological perspective. Mm. So for many years, you could observe that uh, some German car manufacturers somehow stuck to the old uh, idea of the combustion engine and somehow said okay we do some you know some few experiments with electronic uh, engines but right. most the most of thing we we are engaged in is this combustion engine so why did they do it for a simple reason this is what i learned because i had several mandates as a consultant in the automotive industry mm -hmm. it's quite difficult to build a good combustion engine especially a diesel engine is is endless complicated so there are only so many companies in the world who can build a good um, combustion engine and some of them happen to be in Germany 
On the other hand, in um, elect an electric engine, I have been told to build an electric engine is not that hard. Anyone can do it if they follow the instructions. So the the unique selling proposition of building a good engine would be completely gone if everyone drives electric cars. So right. this is the, the, the simple psychological reason why they clung to that old combustion engine for, for such a long time. It's very easily to understand if you see the motives behind it. <laughs> I see. Right, right. Yeah, they're like, hey, we're really good at this and it's hard, so... They felt like they had a real competitive advantage, except that might be going away, honestly. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it looks that's, like. That right? always happens when there's a major technology shift in industries, right. that the people who were quite good at doing it the old way are suddenly not uh, needed anymore. And uh, suddenly new new people arise who are <laughs> the, the, the kings and queens of the modern age. I see. Okay. Well, I just figured I, I was just kind of interesting in my mind to think about. It must be like on a lot of people's minds just in Germany, just people, real, real factory workers and or real politicians of like, Hey, this is our major industry that Germany's good at. They have to stay good at it because that's important for you guys. So you need, you need, you need that radical change more than ever. I think in those, in that industry right now. Right. Yes. But also I can clearly see that now the, the German car manufacturers put much more effort into doing uh, the new cars, producing, developing new cars. And so things are about to change. You, we, we just have to wait and see who's going to win the race. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, you know, hey, we've got a, a few more minutes uh, on the podcast here. But before, before we get out here, there's always a couple um, questions I'd like to ask, ask people towards the end here. And one is about technology. And so I want to get your thoughts on in regard to technology and how the world's changing and how the world of work is even changing um, and, you know, what we're doing now, like with this podcast and being able to connect to people around the world and stuff, what are your thoughts on how you embrace technology or maybe on how businesses should embrace it, you know, and, and what are the, maybe the challenges or benefits? Yeah, um, there's this constant discussion in, among my friends and colleagues. How how can we interpret the the current uh, Corona crisis? And what is the if you if you if you make a balance sheet, what is it going to look like? And no one can deny that as bad as it is, there are always there are also some good sides to it. And mm -hmm. one of them is that all these companies that for many many years said no, we cannot do anything over the internet, no <laughs> technologies, they right. suddenly learned that it works and they have to do it and they are doing it and some of them are doing it quite well. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, the idea of doing things on a virtual basis, less physical and more via the internet is uh, gaining ground and i think that's a good thing mm -hmm. and we should think much more about how we can do it and of course it's not a replacement for everything physical but for many in many situations it is a, a replacement and even a better one and uh, you have to do less commuting and people who like me who are more introverts uh, somehow think there there are many good sides to it when you don't uh, constantly have to travel around and sitting in overcrowded uh, trains and right. or being in a traffic jam on the German autobahn and <laughs> all these things. Um, so sometimes this has a lot of benefits and you save time and uh, you can make it much more cozy uh, when you're working and everything like that. So there are many um, positive sides to the whole situation and you should focus on that and think how how can we benefit from the positive sides of, of all of this. Right. I, I agree. Yeah, it's really maybe fast forwarded the world. The pandemic has fast forwarded the world in, in a in kind of a real way, really, in regards to technology or certainly in communicating and doing business online. So I think it's really uh, will be a benefit in the end, you know, despite all the the really tough parts of, of going through a pandemic and if you're personally affected I'm by it, you know. I'm very much in favor of the internet, and if it if I would have been the king of Germany, I would have introduced all this um, <laughs> video conferencing already ten or fifteen years ago. Right. I had these kinds of clients that required me to, metaphorically speaking, required me to sit on their lap. They wanted me to be there, so when I am consulting, they expected me to be in the office and mm -hmm. be physically there. 
And I said, I, I, I said, in most cases, that's not really necessary. I could do uh, things from anywhere in the world. It's mm -hmm. just that my clients expected it, and that's what I, why I did it. Right. And I hope this is going to change, that many more jobs can be done from a distance, which also means that you can live wherever you want to. Right. You don't have to endure the uh, German winter, for example. <laughs> and, I hear you loud and clear on uh, that, yeah. There's a friend of mine who is a freelance consultant, and for 15 years or so, he has this uh, life... He has this lifestyle, which is quite interesting. He spends three quarter of the year in Germany in summer mm -hmm. and the winter months he spends in Australia. And one day he was interviewed by an Australian radio station and the uh, radio host asked him, so why do you spend every winter in Australia? And he said, because German winter is against human rights. Oh, really? And, uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. I... So in other words, it would be quite nice if we could have more freedom in deciding where we stay and uh, how long we're going to stay there. And um, if if the benefit of all of this would be that more people could have a lifestyle like that, that would be really worth it. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're, I think we've seen it already a little bit and, uh, and now the genie's out of the bottle for a lot more people. And, you know, I think that expectation will be there going forward. And really, I think it's beneficial too. you know, like you don't have to pay for as much office space. I mean, there's, there's a lot of savings like companies realized, Oh my God, we're, paying for this big high-rise building in New York City, uh, we actually found out we don't need it. You know, the company kept rolling and everybody just stays home. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, anyways, in, re in regards to this whole, I guess, recent process you've been through, uh, you're getting your PhD, going out on your own. Um, can you share with the audience maybe a reinvention revelation is what I call it, uh, something that you you know, you found out through this process that maybe you wouldn't have predicted or something you learned about yourself that, you know, was what was, was impactful for you? Uh, not yet. I think that would be too easy. But to give you an example previous to that, okay, I was once involved in um, a project when I was still working for Accenture. And the project was with was with uh, Deutsche Bahn, which is German Railways. We have only this one big railway organization. Ah, okay. And they have all these high-speed trains throughout the internet. So the, 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 the net of trains, the connection of trains is quite very good. So even all the tourists say that you can get anywhere in Germany or mostly anywhere by train and the connections are still quite good. And I was, as in, in those times, as an employee of Accenture, was consulting the German railway with selling their tickets instead of doing it the traditional way in the ticket booth, mm -hmm. selling it via the internet, which was ah. a rather new idea in those times in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And now it's just standard. Everyone buys their train ticket yeah, certainly, in, yeah. in, on the internet. Some people even hop on the train and then they buy their train ticket on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Everything right. is possible, and they have these fancy apps that tell you exactly when your train is going to be late and how much the delay is going to be, and if you have to change your your travel agenda, they even suggest a better way of getting to where you want to get to faster. Mm -hmm. And all of this is just happening just because um, the German railways discover the internet, and and if you talk to young people. Um, that in those days you had to hey, you had to arrive a little earlier at the train station and then stand in line for half an hour to buy your ticket. Right. They just don't believe you. They couldn't imagine <laughs> no, a world like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. They see the world. Uh, yeah. The new generation see the world in such a different way, and I think it's really cool too, because it's just, it's a good to not have that um, in your memory bank sometimes, so you can kind of keep looking at the world differently. Well, you know, Stefan, it's been awesome having you on the show. If if people are interested in killing their sacred cows or figuring out if they ha what their sacred cows are, you know, like going through your process, um, how would people get in touch with you? What would you What would you recommend? Yes, I have a website um, named after my name, which is stefanmeyer.com. Okay. Some people may have difficulties in in writing this, so th the same website can be achieved by a, a second domain I have which is sacredcow.expert so expert actually is a top level domain okay. and if you type into your browser sacred cow in one word sacredcow.expert you will also arrive at my homepage and there is for example there is a cow factor test if you want to test how much you are set up considering sacred cows you can do this online test and it gives you some evaluation and lastly in addition to that i have a twitter account 
and I provide five pieces of advice about digital change every day. So hook up to every my day. Twitter account okay, every wow. day. Okay, wow. All right. I'm going to have to start following that. All right, what's your, so what's yeah. your Twitter? It's Stefan underscore Meyer. But okay. you can also find the links anywhere. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm everywhere in the social media. You can okay. easily find me. Just type in Stefan Meyer, Sacred Cow, and you will find me. Got it. Okay, well, I'll have, I'll have that information also in the show notes. So if you're listening mm-hmm. to the podcast and you can... Uh, kind of just swipe down and probably find those links in there when I uh, get the episode released. So, Stefan, awesome. Thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at jimjimsreinventionrevolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of. Hey, revolutionaries, if you enjoyed today's episode and today's guest, let them know by commenting on their Facebook page, finding their Twitter handle or Instagram feed, and letting them know you heard them on Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, and tell them what you got out of the episode, what you really liked, or how they inspired you. I know they would get a kick out of it, and will help others find the same value that you found.